So uh, this is joint work with Christian Wolf, and the usual Fed disclaimer applies. So, so um, Tom Sargent's talk was a great sort of setup for what I'm about to talk about today. So there's this interest in how stabilization policy, monetary policy, or fiscal policy is different when you introduce heterogeneous households. Okay? And some of the papers, like uh, the one that uh, Tom just discussed, say things are very different when you introduce these redistribution considerations. Okay? And so in my talk, as just was brought up at the end of the Q&A session, I think it's very useful to distinguish between what I'll call transmission mechanism and objectives. So if we had a certain policy tool and we move it, we want to know what happens to, say, output or inflation. And that could be different if we have heterogeneous households. A second consideration is what we're trying to achieve. The objectives of the policymaker could also be different when we introduce this heterogeneity. That would maybe be these redistribution considerations. So I'm going to try to be clear about how both of those two considerations play into answering this question. Okay. So what we're going to do, what we do in this paper, is sort of the familiar linear quadratic approximation to the policy problem that's familiar from representative agent models applied to a heterogeneous agent model. Okay? And then we're going to derive optimal policy rules in the form of forecast target criteria that would apply for any aggregate shock hitting the economy. And so there, there's two or three benefits of taking this approach. Some that are going to be more salient today than others, but one, this approach allows us to sort of separate these two transmission versus objectives considerations. So I'll be able to tell you how does the transmission mechanism change and what does that imply and then what happens when we also change the objective function. Okay? Second, we can write our optimal policy rules in terms of objects that could in principle be directly measured in the data. Okay? And so this sort of directly points to what types of data are going to be informative about the strength of these considerations. Okay? And then a third is that this is quite straightforward to compute. This, these, many of the papers in this, in this area are, are somewhat technical. Ours sort of, because of this linear quadratic approach, is a little bit more straightforward computationally. OK, so in terms of results, I'm going to start with sort of an ad hoc loss function. So we're going to take the usual dual mandate loss function, so where the, the policymaker wants to stabilize inflation, inflation and the output gap. And I'm going to argue that the optimal policy rule is independent of the demand block of the economy. And in this model that I'm going to show you, heterogeneity only affects the demand block. So the optimal rule is independent of the heterogeneity. Okay. So in principle, this mapping from interest rates to output and inflation could be different, but what you're trying to achieve in terms of output and inflation is not going to be affected by heterogeneity. Okay. Then I'm going to go to a Ramsey problem. And when I do this second order approximation of the Ramsey problem, I'm going to get the same two output and inflation terms that are familiar, but then a, a third inequality term that's going to say that the, the policymaker wants to stabilize the distribution of consumption across households. And whether or not this third term exerts a strong influence on the optimal policy depends on how strongly policy can influence that third term. Okay? And, and so there's different models have different implications along those lines. So in the Bandari et al. paper, mo expansionary monetary policy is strongly progressive. So policy can sort of exert a lot of influence on that inequality term. At the like, opposite extreme, Ivan Verning has this uh, aggregation result, if you will. In that context, policy is completely unable to affect that inequality term. And so then the optimal policy kind of doesn't really take that into account because it's something it can't affect. Okay? So what we do is we write down a fairly rich model, and we're going to sort of try to use the model to infer how strongly the policy can influence this inequality term. And in short, we're going to find a world that's very close to this Verning result, that the, the impact of 
expansionary monetary policy on this inequality term is very small, and therefore the optimal policy that comes out of this Ramsey problem looks very similar to what you would get if you just were pursuing the dual mandate objective function. Okay. Okay. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to give a little bit of background that will set the stage for some of the analysis and modeling decisions that will, will come next. Okay. So first, how, what's the sort of standard approach to optimal policy in the representative agent New Keynesian world? Well, you set up a linear quadratic control problem where you take a second order approximation to the social welfare function around an efficient steady state, and you get this loss function here. So you're trying to minimize the deviations of inflation and output. And then you have this linear constraint set, which is a Phillips curve, sorry, an IS curve and a Phillips curve. Okay? And so you're going to minimize that loss function subject to these two constraints. And what you get out of this problem is an implicit rule shown here at the bottom that gives a relationship between inflation and the change in the output gap. Okay? And so that's sort of the implicit rule that determines optimal, that characterizes optimal policy. So I'm showing this because we're going to find similar types of implicit rules for the Hank model. Next, what are the mechanisms, or what are some key mechanisms through which monetary policy can affect household balance sheets and inequality more broadly? So from Adrian's uh, job market paper, we know that the duration of household assets and liabilities matters crucially, because that determines how these, the, the value, the present values of these assets and liabilities react to changes in real interest rates. So in the model, that I'm going to write down, we're going to include a variety of long duration assets and try to match those up to household balance sheets. Okay. Second, incomes of low income workers tend to be more cyclical than incomes of higher income workers. And so that sort of differential exposure of labor income is another consideration that we're going to build into the model. Okay. Oh, and let me say, oh, sorry, go back. So another, another thing that's sort of important in this class of models is the distribution of income between profits and factor income. Okay? And so the standard sticky price model would say uh, prof expansionary policy leads to a drop in profits and a rise in the labor share. Empirically, the labor share doesn't move very much or falls slightly. Okay? So that's... That's something to keep in mind in, in when you're building a model in this class. So what we're going to do, we're going to have special features to match these different considerations. So we're going to have capital, long-term bonds, short-term bonds for assets that households are holding to try to match the duration of household balance sheets. Okay? We're going to redistribute profits to ensure a constant labor share. Okay? And so that's going to kind of neutralize that share. I, I said. These are non-standard features. And then I remembered that Gianluca and Felipe have these in, in one of their papers, so I should say they're like canonical features now. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay, so the model. So we have a, a continuum of households. They have preferences for consumption, disutility for labor supply. Now we're going to model their earnings, EIT, as being sort of generated out of an, an incidence function, people call this. So here, ET is aggregate earnings. Okay. Zeta IT is somebody's exogenous idiosyncratic event. Okay. And this function is going to map, you know, for a given amount of aggregate earnings and your particular type, what are your, your earnings that day. Okay. Now, this shock, this, this variable M is going to be an aggregate inequality shock. So, that, that's going to move around this distribution of income. For any given level of income, this is going to be a shock to the income distribution. Okay. And then the other feature that's an important to notice or for me to explain here is that the, the distribution of income, the way this, this function spits out income for each individual can depend on the level of income. So that can build in that differential exposure to the business cycle. Okay. Okay, so now the budget constraint. So households consume, they purchase assets. I'm going to be more explicit about what that is on the left-hand side. They have some value of the assets that they brought from the last period, including returns. They 
get some earnings net of taxes, and then they get some, some lump sum transfer tau x, okay? So the tau x, I'm gonna sometimes call that like a fiscal stimulus payment. Think of it, every household gets $500, okay? Now the, the tau y is a constant, a constant labor income tax, and the tau e, think of that as a, a tax that's gonna slowly adjust to maintain long run budget balance, okay? So like the papers this morning, um, we're gonna use a union to intermediate labor supply. So in the end, all households will work the same hours and there's gonna be a union that's involved in wage setting. So I'm gonna come to that very soon. Okay, production. So produ out intermediate goods are gonna be produced out of capital and labor. These firms are gonna be subject to standard Calvo rigidities. Now a key, a key issue is that they're gonna a share one minus alpha of the profits that these intermediate goods producers make is gonna be given to workers in the form of some kind of profit sharing or bonus, and this is what's gonna ensure that the labor share is constant, okay? We're gonna assume in the aggregate that capital is fixed, but there's some maintenance slash depreciation cost each, each period, okay? So this, this is like a, a crucial, uh, a qualitatively crucial bullet. So, so our unions are gonna be willing to supply hours based on a marginal rate of substitution between consumption and leisure, and they're gonna think about aggregate consumption when they're deciding on that, that labor supply decision. Okay, so by make, so the, we are sort of neutralizing any distributional considerations on the supply side of the economy here. So we're saying, when this labor supply decision is sort of made by a pseudo representative agent that's making this decision. So I say that's a qualitatively important assumption because it's gonna give us a qualitatively stark prediction. At the end, I can come back and tell you why this is not a quantitatively a strong assumption. Okay. Okay, so this supply side of the economy, we can, we can summarize it with a New Keynesian Phillips curve, and then this equation that says aggregate earnings are just a constant labor share. Okay. 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 So now here's I want to discuss now what assets the households have access to. Okay. So here they have I'm showing three different assets, and I'm going to show the the real return on each of those assets. So there's Aggregate capital stock. So if you own a share of capital, you get the factor payments to capital and you get some part of the, the, the monopoly profits. So you get a share alpha Y distributed among all the, the capital owners. Okay, so there's K bar shares of capital outstanding. You pay some depreciation cost and then you have a unit of capital remaining. This QK is the price of a share of capital or a unit of capital, okay? So this, this ratio is the real return on capital, right? Next line, you, there's a short-term bond. The Fisher equation gives us the real return on the short-term bond. And then lastly, we have a long-term bond. So we model this in the standard geometrically declining coupon way of modeling a long-term bond. So you get some coupon payment, and then you retain a share one minus sigma B of the long-term bond position. So now we're gonna, we're gonna look at a perfect foresight transition path. That's gonna be our equilibrium concept. And so along this perfect foresight transition, all the expected returns have to be equalized, okay? These, are, these assets are perfectly liquid, there's no risk along this transition, so the, the expected return needs to be equalized by no, no arbitrage, but at date zero, when there's some news about policy or some aggregate shock, these asset prices can jump. The realized returns ex post can differ, okay? So, so we have this variety of assets, but what it really amounts to is at date zero, there's gonna be some redistribution according to who owns more of one asset or another. So if there's some lower interest rates, lower real rates, then say the price of capital is gonna jump up. If you're a household who owns a lot of capital, that's good for you. So what does this mean? So, so now in the budget constraint, 
I'm just gonna keep track of the value of every household's asset position. I don't need to keep track of their individual holdings. But, so on the left-hand side, I don't need to have some kind of portfolio choice. I just need to think about the, the total value of savings that you're gonna do. So, sorry, that should be RT in the denominator there. On the right-hand side, I need to keep track of the the value of your asset position coming into the period, inclusive of returns. At date zero, that's gonna, that's gonna be determined by what portfolio you held sort of coming into date zero. But then after, it's just a function of what you chose in the previous periods. Okay. So what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use data from the survey of consumer finance to look at household portfolios and then think about how they would be exposed to surprise returns on capital or, or bonds and sort of get, try to discipline those redistribution effects sort of directly from the portfolio, portfolios we see households holding. Okay. So this is related to something by Adrian and, and Matt in, a, in another paper. Okay, so the government has two tools that we're gonna focus on. They can manipulate nominal rates and they can they can send out these fiscal stimulus payments, okay? Okay, so now to sort of summarize in equilibrium by s combining various equations and linearizing, we can express in equilibrium in terms of two equations. So here, think of this as this bold face notation as a, a time path, like a, a vector of how, say, inflation responds along this transition path. Okay, so we have a new Keynesian Phillips curve equation, and then we have sort of an aggregate consumption equation or generalized IS curve. Where, where this is coming from is from thinking about how a household would respond to different prices that they face in terms of their consumption decisions, and then substituting in, say, the government budget constraint and various asset, my, asset pricing equations to express sort of the aggregate demand side of the economy in terms of various key aggregate variables. Okay. okay. So now I want to discuss dual mandate policy. So why am I doing this? It's not any kind of social welfare function. So there's two reasons. One, it sort of allows me to separate the, the impact of heterogeneity on the dynamics of the economy from the impact on the objective function. And two, this might be the relevant objective function for a central bank whose mandate, say, is to stabilize output and inflation. Okay. So we're gonna have this standard loss function, and now we're gonna switch it into our sequence space notation, okay? So so remember, the bold face variables are vectors of how that variable responds over the time path. Okay, so this, this discounted sum of the squared output and inflation paths now becomes this sort of geometric, this quadratic form of the output and inflation vectors, where W just is this diagonal time discounting matrix. Okay. And then the constraint set are these two linear equations that I showed you characterize the equilibrium, okay? So now we're trying to minimize this quadratic loss function subject to these two linear equations, okay? And so this is, you know, it's a little, you need to know like Adrian and, and Ludwig's like uh, Python package maybe. If you know that stuff, then doing this calculation is kind of immediate. Okay, because those, those C tilde matrices are, are more or less things you can get from their, from their, their package. Okay. okay, so the optimal monetary policy rule is characterized or, by this implicit equation, which is exactly the same one that you get in the representative agent model. Okay, so, so Jordi is gonna say this is obvious. To derive, to derive this rule, you forget about the IS curve and you say that's a slack constraint. We don't need to think about it. Monetary policy can have whatever demand it wants, so we don't need to think about exactly how it does that. And so that, that's the logic. 
here. The demand side of the economy, if you don't have a ZLB or something, the demand side of the economy is not a constraint on monetary policy in the linear model, right? Okay. Okay, so what does this mean? In the, in the representative agent version of this model and the heterogeneous agent version of the model, you would get the same paths for output and inflation in response to any non-policy shock. Now, where you care about the demand side of the economy is how do you implement that, say, that, say that path for Y, right? Because that's how you would, you would think about this. I'm going to minimize the loss subject to the Phillips curve, find the optimal pi and Y, and then I'm going to use the IS curve to figure out what interest rate path I need to get that output path. And now if I change the IS curve, I'm going to change the interest rate path that's needed to implement this outcome. Okay. So in principle, that could be a big deal. Okay. So here I'm plotting the response to a cost push shock under the Hank version of the model and the representative agent counterpart. Okay. So the, what I just showed you before is that for output and inflation, you get, by, you know, by that result, you get the same answer. So what's interesting is over here, what nominal rate path is needed to implement this outcome? And it's pretty similar. That's just what the model is telling me. But I'm, I'm going to go a step further and argue that it kind of has to be that way. We can see empirically what happens when interest rates change to say output or inflation. And so we can measure the whole transmission mechanism that includes these, micro, you know, these issues of microeconomic heterogeneity. And so if it was the case that the Hank model and the Rank model had very different mappings from interest rates to output, we would be able to go to the data and say, well, that model is, is not consistent with these aggregate empirical results. So any kind of model that has the discipline of trying to match up with the empirical evidence that relates interest rates to these aggregate outcomes kind of has to be ballpark similar in terms of its predictions for what happens when you change interest rates. OK. So now the Ramsey problem. So this, this slide is going to take a little bit of, of explanation. OK, so here's my social welfare function. Let me just explain the notation as a first step, OK? So on some level, I'm, I'm taking a weighted average of all the utilities of the households. But I'm using a particular type of notation and particular Pareto weights. So zeta, without any subscript, is a history, an infinite history of idiosyncratic events, OK? So in this model, it's like a model in the Iagari tradition where the households are ex ante the same. And they only differ because they get a different history of shocks, of idiosyncratic shocks. That, that heterogeneity among the households can be described in some sense by how people have experienced these different histories. Okay, so think of zeta as a different history. Okay, and so we're going to be adding up over all of those histories instead of adding up over all of the households indexed by i. Okay? Now, I'm not writing consumption. I'm writing omega times aggregate consumption. Think of omega t of zeta as the consumption share of a household with that history at that date. Okay, so it's just a change of variables. Okay? And then this psi of zeta is I'm attaching a Pareto weight to each history. Okay? So I want to evaluate this social welfare function to a second order using a first order approximation of the dynamics of the economy. So I'm going to want an efficient steady state that I'm taking this approximation around. So the usual thing is you just you put a, a production subsidy to correct for, say, the monopoly distortion that corrects the average level of activity. So I'm going to do that, but then I'm going to do something more. I'm also going to sort of use this, these Pareto weights as sort of a free parameter and back them out from the steady state of the economy so that the planner is happy with the steady state. 
So I'm choosing those Pareto weights so that in steady state, the planner doesn't want to do any redistribution. Okay. And then when there's a shock, the planner is going to want to move the consumption distribution back, or the consumption share distribution, back towards the steady state distribution. So this, this, like, this, loss, this objective function that I'm, I'm constructing here captures concerns about how the cost of some business cycle shock are distributed, but it doesn't incorporate any consideration for long run redistribution, okay? Okay. So then we can do a second order approximation of that social welfare function and derive this loss function, okay? Where the first two terms are exactly the same. As what, we, as what we had in, say, the representative agent version of the model, including those coefficients, okay? So what's new is this third term, which is for each type of household, each zeta, we're thinking about how their consumption shares are gonna be affected by this shock and this policy response. And then, so the, the, om sorry, the omega hat is how that differs from its steady state consumption share. So we're trying to minimi minimize a weighted average of the squared change in their consumption shares. To put it in sort of plain English, the planner wants the consumption shares to look like they are in steady state, look, so like that distri distribution to look like it is in steady state. Okay, so now the constraints we still have the Phillips curve and that IS constraint from before. We also have to add these asset pricing equations because how these consumption shares move depends on how those initial asset prices jump in response to the news, okay? And then we need some equation that tells us how those consumption shares are determined, okay? So this is a little bit of a black box. There's some relationship, linear relationship, between this vector of aggregate variables and the consumption share of a particular type, okay? The logic here is that a household's consumption is gonna move because its income or the prices it's face, it faces move. And so this distribution of consumption shares is ultimately driven by the variables, the aggregate variables that affect the household's budget constraints, say, okay? So I'm gonna take this complicated object, you know, for each zeta, for each type of household, how its consumption share is changed, and I'm gonna express it in terms of how aggregate variables change. Then I'm gonna take this expression here and substitute it up there, and I can integrate out the zetas, and I get an objective function that only depends on aggregate variables, okay? Sort of a long story short, you can convert this complicated thing that involves integrating over all different types of households into a problem where you're just trying to stabilize a list of aggregate variables, okay? And so then, as the analyst who's trying to code this up, that's something you can handle. So relative to what I did before, I need to calculate a particular matrix that gives me the loss function for fluctuations in, those, in that list of aggregate variables. And once you've done that, you're solving the same kind of linear quadratic problem that we had before. All right, so anyway, that was supposed to say this is easy. I'm not sure that was a successful uh, argument. Okay, so here we go. So you can write, the optimal policy rule in terms of these matrices of impulse response functions. Okay. So let's just take uh, theta pi i. The first column of that matrix would be how do, what's the impulse response of inflation to a one-time shock in interest rates that happens today? Okay. The second column is how does inflation respond to an anticipated shock to interest rates that would happen next quarter? And so that's what, that's what these matrices are. They're a bunch of impulse response functions to changes in policy at different horizons. 
So here we have how do the consumption shares of different types respond to policy at different horizons. Right? So that's, that's a complicated thing to measure, but we can me maybe measure things that give us some, some, in, some understanding about what that is. So in particular, we can look at what, what does a, how does the consumption for a household say with low income and low wealth? Like in, in the model, the zeta maps into wealth and income. So we can look at households with different levels of income and wealth and how their consumption is affected by policy. That's kind of the kind of data that this model wants it to be disciplined by. Okay. Okay. Okay, so next. How important, so these two terms would, be this, would exist in a representative agent model. And so what Tom Sargent was kind of getting at with this strong redistribution considerations is this term. That there might be some aggregate shock that would lead to a big move in consumption shares. Okay, so there's some big change in the omega hats. And then if policy can undo that, then that would say these, these theta omega i's are big. Policy has a big influence on the consumption distribution. And so then, in that world, this third term can exert a strong influence on the optimal policy. As I mentioned in the intro, the Verning special case is where these theta ome omega i's are identically zero. So then that third term, poof, it's gone, okay? So, so what are we going to do? We're going to use the model to derive these theta omega i's, and then I'm going to show you some data that kind of speaks to them, and, and we can validate the model. I say in quotes because it's not going to fit perfectly, but that's going to be the idea that we're going for. Okay. So in the model, so what are, what are the kind of main channels that we're able to capture in this model? So we have the income cyclicality. So Gouvenin's work is sort of a key reference on that. And so when we calibrate this income incidence function, we're kind of making reference to those results from Gouvenin et al. Okay. Then we have sort of balance sheet effects. So debt service payments. So when interest rates go down, maybe people with a mortgage are able to refinance and pay lower interest rates. Okay. So that's one kind of consideration. Capital gains, if you own long duration assets, then those assets might appreciate in value when interest rates go down. And then we're gonna have sort of revaluation effects through unexpected inflation. Okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna incorporate that first channel through that incidence function, and then these next three channels through those sort of surprise revaluation effects at date zero. Okay, and so I said we're gonna use data from the survey consumer finance to, to get it at how, how strong those effects might be. Okay, so to explain that, that part of the calculation, let me show you this table which comes from the distribution of financial accounts for the US. Okay, and so what, that, what those accounts do is they take the flow of funds data and then they use SCF data to impute it to different, the, aggregate flow of funds amounts of, say, real estate to different parts of the wealth distribution. Okay. So let's first just look at the total column, okay? So these numbers are expressed in percentage points of, of GDP, okay? So, so households, in total, own assets of real estate and durables that amount to 167% of GDP, okay? So this is what you see in the data real estate, equities, government bonds, mortgage liabilities. And these are the categories that we have in, in the model. Okay, so the, the first step that we're gonna do is we're gonna take each of those rows in the top panel and sort of map it into some bundle of these things down here. So for example, uh, equity, like corporate equity. That's gonna be a leveraged claim on capital. And so we make an assumption about the, the leverage ratio and how much that leverages short-term bonds and long-term bonds, and then 
So we map, if you hold some amount of equity, then that maps into some mixture of these things. Okay, so for each of these categories, we're mapping it into these categories. Okay. So that expresses the assets that you would see in the survey of consumer finance in terms of things in the model. That's step one. And then if we go across a row, this table is showing you how that 167% is distributed over levels of net worth. Okay? So we're gonna take that kind of idea from the survey of consumer finance to, to sort of create a function of net, map net worth into a portfolio. Okay, so at the end of this, this calculation, what we have is for, for any level of net worth, we're gonna impute a mixture of how your net worth is held in terms of these assets. So what, what is that? We're going to have households who have, have gross positions larger than their net positions. So you might have a household who has low net worth or moderate net worth, but they have you know, a house and then they have a mortgage. And so that opens the door for sort of larger redistribution effects than you might think just based on their net worth. Okay. So this is the, kind of like a key figure from the talk. So on the horizontal axis, I'm showing the percentile of, of your percentile in the wealth distribution. And on the vertical axis, I'm showing how your consumption responds on impact after uh, expansionary monetary shock. And the key thing in this figure is that it's pretty flat. So guys in the low wealth bucket and guys in the high wealth bucket, they, their consumption reacts similarly to this expansionary monetary policy shock. So in terms of those consumption shares, the consumption shares aren't moving much. If everyone is moving their consumption in the same proportion, then the consumption shares aren't, aren't changing much. Okay. So this, this is sort of gonna tell you the result, right? So I'm, I'm just showing you that that omega, that theta sub omega is close to zero. That's what this figure says. Okay, so I said I was gonna validate the model. So here's data from Norway. So what, so Holm et al, they look at percentiles of liquid wealth and then how consumption change changes to an expansionary monetary shock. I have two lines because, you know, the, in, empirically these things play out over time. And so this line is sort of looking at a horizon of two to three years. This line is looking at a horizon of four to five years. And you're probably thinking to yourself, that doesn't match very well. Why did you show it? But the key point is, in, take this line. This guy is responding similarly to this guy. So if you had a shock that was sort of bad for the low, low wealth end of the spectrum, you would not be able to say use expansionary monetary policy to boost this guy up without having the byproducts that you're boosting this guy up to. Okay. So yeah, okay. Okay, so here's, let me show you kind of what comes out for two different aggregate shocks, okay? So, First, I'm gonna look at a distributional shock. Remember in that incidence function, I had the M that's gonna tilt the income distribution. So this is a shock that's gonna tilt the income distribution away from low income people and towards high income people. And you can kind of see the effect of the shock over here. This is under the dual mandate optimal monetary policy. The low income guys, their consumption falls, the high, the high income people, their consumption rises. Okay, so that's sort of what this shock is doing. It's an aggregate demand shock. So you're taking income from the, the high MPC people and giving it to the low MPC people. So interest rates, in order to stabilize output and inflation, are gonna fall. Okay. Now here's what happens if you do the Ramsey monetary policy. Okay. So you cut interest rates further but for a very rather short amount of time. It's really in the first, first quarter after the shock, there's about 100 basis points further cut, and then thereafter you kind of follow a similar trajectory. But you're really not able to achieve very much at all here, 
And in terms of output and inflation, you're really not deviating very far from the dual mandate policy. So if you look at the vertical axis here, you're saying you raise output to 10 basis points above steady state. Now, there was a question uh, from Jim to, to Tom Sargent about what if you have a different tool? So now I'm gonna use that fiscal stimulus payment. Send everybody a check. Same check for everyone, but the planner gets to choose how big the check is, okay? So here's the black line, where you're gonna use monetary policy and these fiscal stimulus checks, okay? So on the right, you can see that those do a very good job of smoothing out this inequality issue. And on the left, you see that when you're sending out these checks, you actually don't need to cut interest rates. You slightly increase them. And the logic there is that you, you've kind of neutralized this aggregate demand shock by sending the checks to replace the lost income of the low income people, and so then there isn't kind of a demand shock that you need to deal with with monetary policy. And so in contrast to that monetary policy figure where it was flat, here's how consumption responds to these checks. So the low, the low wealth people they increase their consumption strongly in percentage terms for two reasons. One, they have a high MPC, but also for a low wealth guy, 500 bucks is a big deal, and for a rich guy, 500 bucks is not a big percentage deal for him. Okay, next I wanna, and I'm gonna be done pretty soon, so we're gonna look at a cost push shock, okay? So this is an inflationary cost push shock. The dual mandate says, increase interest rates to fight the inflation. Consumption shares, the low income guys, increase their consumption share. My interpretation is that's coming through this, these asset revaluation effects. It's not an extremely large impact though, if you look at the magnitudes. Now monetary policy, the Ramsey monetary policy does almost identical policy here. Okay. And, uh, and by extension, then you get very, you know, almost identical outcomes for output and inflation. Okay, so let me wrap up. So, so the question that we're trying to address is how does household inequality affect optimal stabilization policy? And so when we look at a dual mandate objective function, we get the same output and inflation outcomes with the heterogeneity and without. And so I mentioned that I made this strong assumption about sort of suppressing the distributional considerations of on the supply side of the economy, right? Now, what I showed you was that this monetary policy doesn't have strong distributional implications in this model. So if you incorporated sort of, instead of doing the marginal rate of substitution with aggregate consumption, you did the average marginal rate of substitution, it would look very similar to what, what I'm showing here. All right, so, so I think it's, it's quite possible that the, like the Hank literature could say something more about the supply side of the economy and how distributional implications impact on the supply side of the economy. But from our paper, our perspective is that monetary policy is not gonna be the driving force of that but sending out checks could be the driving force. Right. For Ramsey policy, you're gonna deviate from the dual mandate if monetary policy has strong distribution implications. Our model says it doesn't, and so then you're gonna stick close to the dual mandate. Um, but our model says that fis these fiscal stimulus payments do have strong distributional implications, so to the extent that we have that tool, and at least in the US, it's been used in recent business cycle episodes, that could be a, a more effective one to use. 